On today's podcast, we sit down with Frank Warren, boxing promoter and Arsenal fan. We discuss the Clash of the Titans fight between Usyk and Fury. We talk about the current state of the Arsenal squad and what's missing, Frank's opinion. Uh, stay tuned for an unexpected guest appearance from Kitman Kev. Hello and welcome to that Peter Crouch podcast with me, Peter Crouch. We've got Chris Stark and uh, no tourists this side day with me, as usual. And, uh, and Mr. Frank Warren. How are you? I'm very, very busy at the moment. I can't complain. Very busy. Pretty busier than we've ever been. We've got so many shows on and uh, mm. it's good fun. Yeah. Is that is that more busy um, promoting or is that more busy uh, acting? Because... Oh, don't. That the pro have you seen the promos, the trailers? I saw the... Uh, what was the one, that, the massive one recently on The Zone? Um, the Day of Reckoning. The Day of Reckoning. Yeah. 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 And then... Well, like a Hollywood film. I mean, we've, how I got roped into that at my age, I do not know. I mean, it's, you know, they're all PG rated, by the way. But... Um, <laughs> Yeah, it was, uh, it was quite an experience. and um, But they spend a fortune on them. They spend, yeah. I mean, on these promos, it's yeah. like it's a different league. They probably spend on a promo what we'd spend on a show. Really? Seriously. I mean, they're all... It looks it, to be fair. They mm. look so good. They filmed... They've done... Eddie and I did our bit in London because I didn't want to go to Iceland. And all the other guys all went to Bulgaria where there's the big studios yeah. and everything and, and the stump men and, and all that. And uh, it was quite, quite a lengthy shoot. And they use... They do it on, on real, on celluloid, like the old style. Yeah. So they do it on film rather than, you know, digital. Yeah, yeah. So it's a very, quite a expensive production. It's been, you know, the feedback's been great, except for my acting. Other than that, really. No, it was, it was superb. I've got to say, especially with you and Eddie around the uh, the table with the cards. Yeah. It was like the scene from, like, Lockstock. Is it, is, is it the lady that... Does she deal with the cards? Have you seen them when they yeah, have a card game yeah. in Lockstock? It's exactly like that. Yeah. Exactly. Like that. They're, they're flipping the cards it, over. Well, it's a, bit, yeah, it's, a bit, yeah, it's a bit of a rip up on it. But it was good, it's good fun and that was the theme of it. And we, yeah. uh, But we did have a laugh, mate. It was class. It was good fun. Really yeah. good. Really, you know really what good. we always talk about on, on here, Frank, is like, is how football's kind of changed. Like we got into it, you know, in the 90s, late 90s. You know, you've been in boxing for so long. Like, how have you seen kind of the boxing industry change and... And evolve. It, well, from when I, I got in, I got in on unlicensed boxing when mm. I first started out. Yeah. I was a kid. I was 20, 23, 24, and I started promoting. And talking about Lockstock, my cousin, second cousin, yeah. Lenny McLean, that's it, yeah. he was in that, yeah. and that's who I first I didn't promoted. know that. I didn't know mm. your, he's a relation of yours, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's, a, he's passed away now, but he's yeah. a relation of mine, and he, yeah. was, he was fighting a guy called Roy, Roy Shaw. Shaw. Yeah. It was a bit, quite a long story, but, you know, he, and, now, and it was in Croydon. I in Croydon, wasn't it? It's Sinatra's, Sinatra's in, in spelt with a C. That's it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, it was like a nightclub in country. But it was, it was uh, I went as a punter and it was like, you know, I, I was involved in, I come from Islington, I had a few nightclubs and, uh, or drinkers as they called them, and a couple of pubs. Well, about three or four pubs I was involved in. And I was in the machine business as well. And uh, I got, in, I just got in, went as a punter and next minute I was involved in it purely, not by design, wow. purely by accident. So you've yeah. went, you've just gone to watch Lenny fight? Yeah. Right? And and then, so how does that evolve from there, watching him fight? Well, he, to, he didn't fight. He came out, he didn't train an inch for the fight as right. it turned out. I mean, I never got on too well with him. and mm. But I went with my Uncle Bob to see him, my late Uncle Bob, and we went, watched him. And the first round, he fought a guy called Roy Shaw. Shaw yeah. Roy, pretty boy Shaw yeah. from, mm. from uh, Dagenham, who mm. was like, he was, he was a bit bit of a colourful past. Yeah. And they're much older, obviously much older than me. And um, he came out and Lenny, Lenny just shaped up and he threw a punch and his legs all went and that was the last punch he threw. And then after that, he just put his arms up on the ropes like this and went to Shaw, go on then. So Len, Len, Roy Shaw must have hit him about 50 times and he just slid down the ropes at the end and that was it. And like we went to the dressing room afterwards and my uncle gave me a real bollock and he said, hey, what is the matter with you? Yeah. Why would you let someone do yeah. that to you? And uh, that was that. And then about six months later, they made a rematch. And um, come the week of the... Uh, sorry, my uncle then got him and said, you're, you're going to fight someone, you're going to be go with a trainer. Mm. So you got Freddie Hill, who used to look after the Finnegan brothers, yeah. mm. who were real good, you know, quality fighters, Chris Finnegan and, uh, and Kevin. And uh, he trained him for the fight, but because he was licensed by the boxing board, he couldn't go in the corner. So come the week of the fight, he's got no cornerman. And on the night of the fight, my uncle, Bob, and me were his cornerman. 
I don't even know. I don't even go. Now you're involved. Now you're in. You know, it's like me taking over a football club. What do I do? Yeah. You know? And that was how it happened. And but then, uh, but then you're in. You're in yeah. the sport at that point. I'm in it, and they're talking about if he wins because it's all that sort of like you know, it's a bit not murky, but you mm. know, it was what it was. And if he wins, he's all this going. And he knocked out Roy. He knocked Roy yeah. Shore out, and uh, then. And it just mm. progressed from there, and next minute I'm promoting these fights. <laughs> yeah. So how, how does it how does it evolve then? So like you you know when does it become you know you're one of the most senior people in the, certainly in the UK if not the world now. I mean you're too young, but when I used to go to fights years ago. You know people had glove up in the ring because they weren't live on TV. Mm. The, the, if any only the main event would come into music, which would probably be a fanfare, it'd either be a record. Mm. Scratchy old seventy eight yeah. record or you know trumpeters from one of the uh, regiments. And that was it. So I started putting music on and, you know, letting them come in, getting some identity and, you know, jazzing it all up and everything. Was that your moves at that point? Were yeah. you changing boxing? That, I mean, obviously it's now so exaggerated and over the top and you're making movies as promos. And But were the, do you think those were the sort of the starting points of what boxing is now? And did you introduce those then? Well, I've, I've always been, a, you know, I've been, always been a music a music nut. I mean, I love my music. I'm always going to concerts or whatever I can do. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I sort of got a little... F f in those days, I used to pick the music which every fight I come into myself. So, you know, I'd get them... Because that was the image I was trying to build. And then the boxing board... And I started doing... I'd done it for a few years with what they called... They, were, they weren't unlicensed, but they called them unlicensed mm. because the boxing board of control didn't recognise it. And then... I was doing quite well. We were getting we were getting good crowds there, and and Wembley and the Albert Hall, which were the traditional venues in London, and the only venues really in London, you couldn't book them because the as what we referred to as the cartel, which was Mike Barrett, Mickey Duff, Jarvis Sustair, and um, and Terry Lawless, they had them all tied up, so you couldn't do them. So you had to. Be, I was putting shows on like in cinema room cinemas. Uh, ballrooms mm. in hotels, circus tents, because you couldn't get anything. And uh, they, you know, we started really get catching on, and it became like a bit of an underground thing. Yeah. And then the boxing board of control invited me to take a license out because I think they wanted me inside the tent rather than mm. outside. And then once I was in there, then they, then their regulations and everything, mm. uh, they used them to good effect against me because up until then they hadn't really had to make any decisions because. It was the same group running the shows. Yeah. It was only BBC TV that broadcast um, boxing. There was nothing on ITV other than overseas boxing. They didn't do anything domestically. Mm. And they were the only two channels. So um, it was a quite, a, quite a little cosy operation. And I sort of upset the apple cart. And I, was young, and I was having the time of my life. I was enjoying it because it was like a challenge. And I'm sort of like yourself, you know, you mm. two guys. I'm competitive in my way. And... The more they were saying you couldn't do it, the more I wanted to do it, the more I was in it, and the more I was driven by it. And uh, it was it was it was good mm. fun, and it, and it was good fun. It was just a, it was a laugh, and I had a good group of people working with me, and we just uh, we just mm. sort of took the challenge and marched on. And eventually, I got in got some TV, and once I got the TV, uh, I then wanted to get live TV, and the boxing board of control didn't allow live TV because they felt that. If it was live on TV, then it would affect the, the yeah. crowd. Same as football. Mm. You know, yeah, football yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The three o'clock blackout. Yeah, same nonsense. And but it doesn't. And uh, so I, I to more or less we got to a stage where we we're just about going to court and they capitulated. So all you said there, all them venues all tied up. Was that when sort of York Hall you had to sort of go to couldn't, couldn't go to York Hall. They Still had York Hall as well. Oh wow. They had everything. So I I was uh was it the Bloomsbury Hotel, uh as I said, Rainbow Theatre. The old Tottenham Royal. Yeah, I was going when I was a kid. Yeah, yeah. Any, anywhere which you could get some people into. And what what were they? What were the, what was it like in there? What was the atmosphere like in oh, places brilliant. like that? Was brilliant. it? Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, because <laughs> you know it's brilliant. Everybody loved it, and we used to and the music and hyping it up. And I mean, there was no round card girls back then. We used to have mm. the round card girls and mm. all. I mean, I mean, I know you had some of that in America, but over here, nothing like that. So we'd have the round card girls on, and, and it's just a. You know, trying to give people, make it interesting in between the yeah. fights and make it more of an experience on the night. And I'm looking, obviously, at the people you've worked with over the years, right? Prince Nazim Hamid, you know, Frank Bruno, Tyson Fury, obviously, Joe Kalsaki, Nigel Penn, Steve Coy, a lot of them showmen, right? Yeah, Chris yeah. Eubank, Amir Khan, Ricky Hatton, Joe Parker, you know. the, the they Those boys there were, were showmen, 
right? And I suppose that is, you know, selling a fight is, is half the battle, isn't it? As well, as well as being a top boxer. I mean, it's nothing new what's being, you know, that's being done. It's how, you know, see how you do it. You go back to Muhammad Ali. He was influenced by Gorgeous George, mm. the wrestler. Mm. And he picked up on this wrestler who was fa very famous in America at the time and started to emulate, you know, I'm the greatest, I'm this and that. And, and you know, British, there was some colourful British fighters back then, like, you know, Henry Cooper was, yeah. Freddie Mills. Yeah. I mean, long before, I, mm. most people won't even remember these, but they were quite colourful fighters in their own right. And then, uh, and then, you know, then we, then along came Bruno, mm. who become, not become a personality through really that double act with him and Harry Carpenter, yeah, which yeah. happened by accident. Naz, we, we, with Naz, what we did with Naz, we actually sat down and thought about what we were going to do and, and he got it and he understood it yeah. and you could work with him and everybody bought into it and all the youngsters loved him and all the older generation hated him. Mm. Like all the older generation yeah, of course hated would. Yeah, Man traditionalists, yeah, they wouldn't like they him like coming up to the ring and ring and doing a somersault you know, into the ring. I used to yeah. absolutely <laughs> love it. I remember yeah, watching yeah. him, honestly, you just, just yeah. couldn't believe it, could you? Um, were, were these regulations then that you, you know when you describe having a fight against regulations when you were working your way through, is that something that you've always found that you've done to be able to bring in this this entertainment and maybe some of this glamour as well that you've had to kind of go up against you know what, what i felt and i think I, i'm not saying i'm i'm right about everything but if you're trying to bring the sport in into into the into the modern day and for and for boxing back then it was it was like trapped in the sort of like the 40s you no know, 1940s but you want to take it you want to bring it forward and you want to attract a new a new and a young audience mm. And that's what we mm. did. We worked on that. And the TV audience, especially with the TV companies, you're going live on TV. It's all about viewers. I mean, we were getting like 20, 20, 23 million people, 20 million people, 15 million people watching boxing matches mm. back then. I mean, yeah. huge, huge numbers. Huge numbers. Yeah. What, what, what do you make of all the, obviously, the, the, the misfit boxing stuff and the, the YouTubers and obviously Jake Paul and, and Mike Tyson just been announced? I don't, I don't like, I don't like that because I think some of these things are an accident waiting to happen. I like Jake mm. Paul. I've mm. met him a few times, and Nikita, he's manager. They're very, he's a very smart guy, Jake yeah. Paul. He really gets it. He's yeah. a good promoter, mm. and he gets it. And that will do massive business. There's no doubt about it because it's basically it's like a freak show. Mm. Or maybe a car crash that people drive past and they stop and they to look at the mm. cars. Right? Misfits, you know, isn't, it? isn't that what they're trying? Yeah. To and the misfit try. stuff. I mean. Uh, what I don't get about that, I mean, you know, with the greatest respect, like you two mm. could join, go into that by saying, mm. I'm going to have a fight. Where am I going to do it? I mean, mm. they would do it on the Misfits. Yeah. You've got no background of boxing or no. nothing. You've got, you know, it's not just blokes, it's mm. men as, uh, sorry, it's women as well are mm. doing it. And some of it is just so poor, it's untrue. Mm. But as long as they're medically safe, you know, they've got medical facilities on the night, they're checked and everything, they're over 21. That's their choice, what they want to do in life. I'm a big believer. If you want to climb a mountain and it's safe to do it, you want to go and dive down the bottom of the sea, that's your choice. And if you want to go and fight, that's your choice. At least you have a choice. Yeah. Mm. What do you make of that fight, though, with, with Mike Tyson? Have you seen him recently? Do, do you know what kind of shape he's in? <laughs> I know, like he's in I, all, I know the, all I know is he's 58. That's all yeah. you need to know. You know, what's a 58 footballer, 58-year-old uh, footballer yeah. going to do in a football team? Mm. Yeah. You know, it ain't going to happen. And... He'd be he be vintage Mike Tyson for maybe a round, mm. but that'd be but if he catches him, yeah, yeah, it could happen. But mm. after that, he'll just fade and fade because he's an old guy. Yeah, mm. it's cool. And he doesn't and he doesn't live, he hasn't lived the life, has he? I mean, let's be honest. All and all he's doing all day long is blowing. Yeah, mm. and that's it. He loves a puff, and that's what he does. <laughs> <laughs> he, does he does as well. <laughs> yeah, oh, obviously, right. More more kind of current day. Tyson Fury versus Usyk. Um, Obviously, this is incredibly exciting fight. What um, what are we saying? What do we do? For, well, do you we got. I mean, it's a fight that everybody's been waiting for. But they talk about it like they've been waiting for years for it. Mm. He only won the title, I think, about just over two years ago. Usyk, when he beat Joshua, yeah, I think that's roughly whatever its mm -hmm. time was. And you can look back over the years and think, how long was it before Lennox Lewis fought Mike Tyson? It's like mm. ten years. Yeah. And there's been lots of lots of situations like that. This has happened fairly quick in boxing. Two fighters, both undefeated. Mm -hmm. I mean, got immaculate, immaculate records in as much of, of what they've done with their careers. In Usyk, you've got a guy who's, you know, Olympian yeah. at the top level. Um, 
cruiserweight. I think he was the best cruiserweight of his generation, mm-hmm. superb cruiserweight. And then come up to heavyweight, and he's been a heavyweight now for, what, four years? He's beaten Joshua. Yep. Uh, twice, twice, you know. So yeah. I mean, that's a that's a, that's a big thing. And he and going into those fights, he wasn't favourite, and he beat and he beat him on merit. And he's fighting Tyson, who yeah. uh, you know for me is the best heavyweight on the planet at the moment, who's coming off of a a win against a guy who had his very first fight. Yeah, but a t- you know, a guy who had come from a fighting background, mm. MMA fighting background, and people may look into that and think there's some chinks in the armor there. Yeah. So there's a lot of it makes it more interesting. It does. It quite more interesting. Yeah. There's, a lot, there's a lot of talk at the moment whether how Tyson's going to come out. Is he going to just use his reach, you know, and then, or is he going to try and get up close? A lot of people now are saying that he's going to get in close and try and get close to Usic because he looks incredible, doesn't he? I mean, he's, he's probably the best I've seen Tyson Fury looking. Even, and, and this is obviously with the, the delay yeah. that's still got, what, four, four, four weeks to go? I was talking this morning and they said that he... Tr- Trained this morning, looks extremely well. Well, first of all, he got to look at. He was in training camp before Christmas for the fight, and he sustained that cut, which was probably his last week of sparring. So coming up to that, he was coming up to peaking for his fight. Got the cut, but he was in good nick. Mm. So he's had a couple of weeks. He had a couple of weeks fight, but he's managed to go back into the gym where he's not losing weight. Yeah. So he's in good nick anyway. Yeah. And what I was worried about is that he may over, mm. you know, may peak too soon. Mm. But he's Got his training dead right, so he's building to the, you know, building to get to his best by the uh, 18th of May, and he will be. And I think that Usyk's going to have his hands full. I, I, mm. I generally feel he will stop Usyk. Mm. Yeah, I think he'll do it. Yeah. Wow. What What's he like, Tyson Fury, just to to work with as a as a as a person? You know, his family. Obviously, you know, we watched all watched the documentary recently. <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me of my family, to be honest. <laughs> so we've got similarities in that way. Um, what What is he like day to day? Tyson's uh, Tyson's funny. Mm. He's got a great sense of humour. He's very very smart. He's mm. very very much on it. Gets involved in all the detail of all the business. So he's mm. not. He's you know he's nobody's fool. Very, very astute guy. Um, and he just wants to fight. He loves fighting. Yeah. I mean, his past problems that he had have been well documented Ooh. with the booze in and he yep. was doing stuff he shouldn't have been doing. Mm. He had a couple of things that were said. Some, I think, were taken out of context. One, maybe he shouldn't, you know, he, I know he regrets saying, but that's all in the past and he's he's moved on. And, he, and what I admire about him, he's a guy who was at the very top, having beaten Klitschko, yeah. went to the other guy's backyard and beat it, beat mm, the best yeah. heavyweight of his generation. And then it all went. Mm. Then it all went downhill, all the problems and so forth. And he's come back from that. And he was on the verge of suicide. He was very suicidal. Uh, he was 11 stone overweight, mm. you know, mm. huge. I mean, he was so carrying so much weight. And he's got rid of that and he's got his life back on. on and he's done that all through sport. Mm. Mm. Through sport, through having having a goal. And his goal was to get in the gym, get himself well, because physically if he's well, mentally he's well. But he needs, when he's in the gym, something to aim for. Yeah. And to aim for is to aim to fight. Mm. So once he's got his date, he's like that, you know, you don't hear anything from him. That's sitting there, I've got my date and I'm off. And I'm going to be there on the night, and that's all that matters. Is that is that kind of how it works in terms of your relationship with him? So you're obviously not going to be in the gym, or you'll not be on his training camps. So you'll no. just be checking in from time to time, just getting little. He's top got. Ups. He's got. A, he's, he appointed a manager uh, probably about eighteen months or so ago, Spencer Brown, who's very yeah. good, done a very good job with him, does a very good job for him. So Spencer's there. He's got his family around him. He's got his trainer Sugar, who he's mm. quite loyal to. His dad's now in the camp. Yeah. And that you know he he's really he's on the money and yeah. and we did a press conference a couple of weeks ago up in Morecambe where he where he lives and where he's based mm-hmm. for his training, and I'm, I can't tell you he was in, he was just so he was on such good form I was I was yeah. delighted he couldn't be any mm. better. Yeah. Is he is he quite receptive to your advice? Yeah, if it's it, it depends. I mean, you know, it's bad. It's like everybody's got an opinion, and I'm a big believer if. If people you've got you've got some you've got some sensible people around you you've got some some around you who've been through it and know what they're talking about then you listen to them mm. you know I, I'm not going to listen to the bloke in the pub who's going to tell me you know why is you know 
why is Tyson not fighting this bloke tomorrow or whatever, you know, but but sensible opinion he he listens to. He's he's nobody's fool, I promise you. He's a very, yeah. very smart guy. Yeah. Very he's a he's as smart outside the ring as he is inside the ring. You know, Fury Joshua, are we get are we gonna see that? I think if they keep winning, and I believe Tyson will win, and then there's a rematch clause and yeah. That that happens, uh, and and providing AJ keeps winning, mm. I think it's a fight you'll see. Yeah, mm. and it's a fight every. I want to see it. Yeah, you know, I've always felt that Tyson would beat him, and I'd like to be because I'm I'm a Noel. I want to be proved right. Mm. You know, with um, negotiations, and uh, I'm sure there's all sorts of intricacies with it. Aside from the money. Does it ever get quite personal in the negotiations? Is there ever something that has to go on the table just as a kind of, I don't know, it's like something really personal just because they can or because you can? Look, they're people, you know, and everybody got their different idios idiosyncrasies. They're all, you know, you get fight. There was no love lost. I, I think they do respect each other, but there was no love lost certainly at one time between Tyson and AJ, no doubt about that. Now, I don't know. I mean, now it's probably changed. They're professionals. They know they're doing the best they can in the sport they're in for their family. But when we're sitting down, we're getting down to the thing that who's going to walk in the ring first, whose yeah. name's going to be called yeah. out first. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Is, and, is, is know, that a big it, part of it? Oh, it's, a, it's a pain in the ass. Oh, I just it. say, <laughs> spin a coin, whoever does that, and then you just alternate. Mm. Yeah. But, but I can't tell you, some of, the, some of it is just like you bang your head against the wall. Mm -hmm. Hi, Peter Crouch of that Peter Crouch podcast. Uh, we called to arms last time. We asked you to subscribe. Plenty of you did subscribe, but of course we need more. Uh, we'd love you to subscribe. Hit that subscribe button if you enjoy our content, if you enjoy the podcast. really does help. Is the future of the sport, like in Saudi Arabia, is that where the majority of the fights are going to be? You know, you're getting offered, you know, 100 quid to fight at Wembley, or you can go and earn 500 quid to go and fight. So, yeah. You know, what are you going to do? You, you've got a family, you want to set you know, set yourself up and your family's up for just yeah. the security for the future. And that's what what you do. Mm. But uh, he, um, where, what happened with Vegas, all the big fights used to take place in New York, all the big fights. Then they opened the casinos up mm. in Vegas, or some of them, and they started paying money to promoters to bring the fight there so they get the punters there. So you're mm. getting... You know you're guaranteed money, as whereas if you was in Madison Square Gardens, you had to sell your tickets to make your yeah. money. So you got a guarantee before mm. you start, and that's really what's happening in Saudi now. What they're doing now, Riyadh season, which is a massive, massive cultural event in in uh, in Riyadh, multi multi uh, sports, entertainment, every every big name mm. you can think of from any, not just Western sports, Eastern mm. part of the world, you know, Middle East, everybody's playing there or or performing there, and they, they've made a commitment to boxing. I mean, Tyson against Nagano opened the Riyadh season. Mm. And everyone that was season. there at that fight as yeah. well. I was mean, it was yeah, crazy. It was, yeah, was I, mean, it was, I mean, there were 60 world champions <laughs> at the banquet <laughs> yeah. the night before. I mean, you know, all the... Were you at that? Had, yeah, yeah. Just a, being I mean, in that's the room, a hell of a table. You look at everywhere you looked, you're like, like, as a hero, yeah. there's a legend. And <laughs> it was just, a, it was unbelievable. But... It's a destination now. It is a boxing destination. We're lucky with His Excellency Turkey mm. Al-Sheikh that he is a massive, massive boxing mm. fan. He watches everything. He's got this big screen in his house and he sits there, he watches a fight from your call, from America, from Japan, yeah. knows all their names, wow. knows every, you know, you talk, and, it, and it's refreshing for me because you're not just selling an event, you're selling it to somebody who really does believe in what they you know, believes in it. Like, it is incredible. Like, the 5v5, the Matchroom versus Queensbury, I mean, look, the, the list yeah. of, you know, it's like, right, this is your stable, this is your stable, you pick five of your best, and then we're going to go for it on one night. Like we said earlier on, it just seems so easy. Why was it, why, why was this not done before? It was just, it's got to a point where, I mean, and the, the bill was huge, is it? I mean, every, every single fight is a 50-50 fight, they're, isn't they're it as well? Cr they're Literally. crackers. I mean, mm. and it's on a card that is yet another unification fight. Four belts on the line, yeah. Bebetiev and Bivol. Yep. Both records, I think they're both 20 and 20 wins, no losses. And Bebetiev's got the most perfect record, 20 fights, 20 knockouts. Yeah. 
and then we got this, then we got the five v five. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's just. But it's a great normal. concept as well because it's UV Eddie Hearn as well. Yeah, right? yeah. And that's that's, yeah, and that's pay, and that is box let's office. <laughs> let's get out of this bit. <laughs> well, we who would promote your misfits. fight? That's that's a, such a good point, Archie. Who would promote the fight between them two lads? <laughs> <laughs> well, that I mean, that's what people want to see. And I think, um, I mean, how do you get on with Eddie Hearn? I, I only met. Yeah. I only first time I met him was probably about. What's it probably about six, seven weeks ago? It's through my son George, who's the CEO of mm. of uh, he's the he's the CEO of um, Queensbury, mm. and he's the one sort of like banged the heads together and got the thing going. But yeah. but it, but it all happened again through His Excellency, who said, you know, I want to. He just sprang it on us. I want yeah. to see your guys fight his guys. Well, that suits me down to the ground. We'll have some of that. It actually happened quite easily. Once it was, once everybody was on the same page, yeah. right? Let's put it. Who you got? You got. Yeah. Well, first of all, we picked the weights. Right? Yeah. What are the weights? Our picks: heavyweight, middleweight. He picked featherweight and light heavyweight. And then His Excellency had a, a pick, and he went for another heavyweight, heavyweight fight. Yeah. So that's that. Once you got that, now you look at your roster of fighters, and you say, right, I'm gonna, mm. you know, we're gonna put in our fighters who we feel were the best at that weight, which we've done, and for the for a uh, HEs. Selection, you could go and sign a fighter. Yeah. And we're quite strong in the heavyweight division. So he went and signed, signed Wilder. Wilder and yeah. Big Bang Zhang was with yeah. us. So that's where we were. That's a, big, that's a big fight, isn't it? Because the loser of that is got nowhere really You're to go. You're absolutely right. It, you know, that, both of them lost their last fights. Yep. Um, Zhang was in a very close fight with um, Joe Parker. Mm. Joe Parker won the fight. Not yeah. take, don't want to be yeah. disrespectful to him. Zhang seemed to fade you know, over the last couple of rounds, having had. Parker on the floor twice, but Wilder wasn't at the races. No. He came back from South America. He'd done that. High, mm. Was it high was got that drink or whatever they're mm. taking out there? Yeah. I can't remember what they call it. So he he, <laughs> he took that and he he just seemed like a different person. And uh, in the fight, there didn't seem any urgency with him. And again, I don't want to take nothing away mm. from Joe mm. Joe Parker because he'd done everything that you had to do in that fight. So now. He's got to show what he's all about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, he can't afford it. If he if he loses this, he's done it. Yeah. He's done at that level. Mm. And also, look, I think Eddie to spur him on, maybe to spur him on. I don't know, or he, or he knows more than I do. He's made him captain, captain and if yeah. you're captain, you get double points. Yeah. So okay. it's going to be quite yeah. quite interesting. We're talking your captain, Shiraz. Is it your captain? He's a good fighter. He's, he's in a tough fight, by the way. Mm. He's well, obviously, he's, he's come against Williams, who's probably going to be his fastest, nippiest yeah. opponent. Whereas right. well, Williams is going to be pay, facing obviously Shiraz. is probably yeah. his heaviest hitter that he'll face as well. So, well, I, I like Hamza. He's done everything that's been asked for him. He's not, you know, he, and he came into sport not from a you know a brilliant am, amateur background yeah. or you know high high profile amateur background but I like fighters like that. I like guys who do it the hard way mm. you know they're not off the podium squad where they're getting paid wages yeah. every week you know they've had to really grind it out and he's done as a pro he's done everything that's been asked for him but this is a big step up for him and he carries the responsibility again of being captain of our team yeah but Frank you always listen you've always been known for, for straight talking right and uh, there's de this development of a public argument with Carl Frotch at the minute uh. what where did that all stem from? I don't know. I mean, him and I never really got on. He, he He's a bit of a porky pie. Yeah. He tells a story about Joe Kawasaki. See, I, I, mm. he's, you know, it's Carl, the, we call him the Kawasaki Dodger. That's what we all call him. <laughs> he said for years that he wanted to mm. fight him. And I had two meetings with him. I met him in a polo bar of the Westbury Hotel. And he brought this bloke along who was his financial advisor. His contract was coming to an end. And I was trying to make the fight of him and Kawasaki. Yeah. And he, did, he just didn't want to know. Then we had another meeting, same thing. It never happened. Which I'll get if you don't want it. Maybe maybe at that stage he didn't think he was ready for it. But stop telling the telling stories mm. about it. You, yeah. did, you had an opportunity and you didn't want it. And then um, he was number one. He was the official number one. And never, ever did they push for that fight. And what I found with Carl, all he does is slag fighters off. He, Amir Khan, who was a young kid who turned pro, he was, I mean, he kept having to pop at him. He was like, he turned pro when he was 18. He's a mm. man, what are you having to go? It's like jealousy thing, like, because they're doing well and they're getting publicity. Mm. And he does it all the time. He's done it with Tyson. And uh, his latest thing is about, you know, you go to the Middle East. And I did it when I went to the Yemen with with um, Nassim years mm. ago. We went there. And it, it a sign of respect there. And, and, I, and I thought they were getting me at it to start with. We got off the plane. I said, as we get off the plane, it's a sign of respect that, you know, if they... That they hold hands. 
So you get off the plane, the sports ministers help get me hand. And you know, it's not something we do here. We get that and we're walking along. And that was like, that's about 30 years ago, mm. probably 28 years mm. ago, whatever it was. And the same happened with, with uh, His Excellency out there. It's a sign of respect. Yeah. So you, and people's cultures are people's cultures. You should respect them. And to come out of all that crap you come out of, mm. it's quite, it's stupid and, uh, and, and, you know, it's a bit ignorant. But, you know, he is a, he, he also believes the earth is flat. Mm. Right? Is that a fact? I did see that. Flat earth. Flat earth. <laughs> Has he flat earth this? Believes or is that no, he did. No, he, he genuinely said the rebuttal. The no, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there was no land. That, uh, there was no landing on the moon. No uh -huh. men have been to the moon. So India, China, Japan, Russia and America have all conspired because they're all good mates. <laughs> all conspired that they sent uh, yeah. <laughs> satellites up and people up. And it's just, it, 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 but he's a nut. He's a total nut. I mean, we're calling it a flathead society. Mm. But it, <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, so listen, we are a football podcast, believe it Good. or not. Yep. And um, you're an Arsenal fan, right? Mm. And so where did that all come about? Was that was that through choice? Is that through your dad? Have you always been, a, have you been a family of Arsenal fans? Fam, family of Arsenal fans. Um, I was born in Islington. Well, well I was born in Finsbury, which became Islington. Mm. I went to Highbury County Grammar School, which was just in uh, just up the road from Arsenal Stadium. And I went there from a very young age with my mates. We used to go, I remember going to schoolboys' entrance. We used to pay ninepence to get in. And I was a skinny kid. I was skinnier mm. than you. <laughs> I was a skinny kid and used to, have the, used to be able to get through the railings and then into the clock. Then we used to walk around the ground, you know, clock end yeah. on an old bank. I used to do that. My dad used to have a season ticket in the West Stand and Ken Fry, who was the, mm. who was, uh, the uh, CEO there, um, he was a big friend of mine and he was a big friend, of, you know, big friend of my family's and uh, for many, many years. So... I've just been an Arsenal nut and and I love it. My brother's a Spurs fan. He's yeah. the only one in there, but he got dropped on his head when he was a baby. <laughs> but we Robert, my brother Robert is a Spurs fan, but we're, you know, we're a you know, big Arsenal, all my kids are. As soon as any of the, my, my son Francis married and, and uh, my son George both married girls whose family are Spurs fans. So as soon as our kids, my grandkids were born, the first thing they got was Arsenal shirts. <laughs> yeah. So they, I converted yeah. them, I baptised them. Day <laughs> so, but we're, yeah, big yeah. fan. Um, I can remember going, my big hero when I was a kid was Joe Baker. Okay. Who Arsenal, I think they paid a hundred, just over a hundred grand for, which is a record transfer back yeah. in the early 60s um, for a centre forward. And uh, and I remember, I remember, I remember a Liverpool game. Arsenal played Liverpool in the cup at Highbury. It was the fifth, I think it was the fifth round of the cup in those days. And they and Joe Baker got sent off for knocking out Ron Yates. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's what turned me on the box. Yeah. <laughs> um, all, of the, um, all the things Arsenal have done over the years, yeah. you picked out someone knocking someone up. <laughs> no, I no, because Joe Baker, Ron Yates, was a big guy. And Joe, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, no, but I, I, I can remember bunking off school. They had a terrible winter in 1963 when everything was frozen everywhere this, for about three months in the season, all the matches being postponed. And Arsenal were the only team or only club that had an under heat, under, under pitch heating. Yeah. Mm. But they couldn't use it because, well, they could use it, but no one could get to the ground because all the snow so was there. Yeah. And eventually they played Oxford United. It was an afternoon match. Uh, they put it on, I think it might be a Friday afternoon or something like that. And we all bunked off of school. I asked the one five. And I remember going, I remember that match, going to see that one. And we got in, I remember all getting the cane. They used to cane you in those days. Mm -hmm. I remember getting the cane when we went back in on the Monday. <laughs> <laughs> something special about, about Arsenal though and, and Highbury in general. Yeah. Like, I remember playing there as a kid like with like, Tottenham <coughs> against, uh, against Arsenal in the Premier Youth League mm -hmm. final and walking around those marble halls and oh, re yeah. remembering the history a, of it all. And it, 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 I mean, it's a beautiful stadium. The old stadium, I've got an apartment there, but the old mm. stadium is just... Well, it's, it's traditional, isn't it? They're a traditional club. It's mm. the Arsenal. I mean, yeah. I know they say it's the, the Arsenal, Arsenal way yeah, yeah, and yeah. so forth, but it is the Arsenal way, and they've mm. always had such fine traditions. And you know, the, the 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 years of George Graham. I know George very very yeah, well. Yeah, Frank yeah. Clinton and I were partners. Right. We had a not we had a nightclub together, Frank and I, down in the Barbican. <laughs> 
Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Where was that? What was that called? It was called the Barbizon. Right. It was just we had that in the in the uh, when was that? Trying like to work 19... out if you've been there. No, 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 no. <laughs> I didn't have known it. Yeah, you would have. No. Been, you would have been old enough. No. <laughs> yeah, we was that was about nineteen seventy nine. We had a, yeah, we had a nightclub down there. Yeah, yeah and were you obviously you were in that kind of scene for a little bit. Like, did you see many of the players out or? Yeah, they still be out. Well, it was I mean, part and parcel, yeah, wasn't it? I mean, back that was, in the day, that, that was that. You know, Arsene Wenger. That what I think that is his biggest contribution mm. to football that he changed all of that mentality, yeah. didn't he? The booze mentality went out mm. the window. I think our you're looking at like you know Tony Adams, all mm. the guys that you know that 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 mm. back that back those defenders. All of the, all of them, I think, got an extra few years out of their yeah, career yeah, yeah, because of yeah. because of what yeah. he brought in and yeah. changed the whole dynamic. I mean, everybody caught up with it and all, all did the same Everyone thing. But, now, yeah. but he did change that. He was quite. Mm. He's a very sort of um, erudite guy, isn't he? Yeah. So, you know, he's re, he's re, he's you know he, he he talks about football and it's it's a joy to hear. But everybody has their time. Yeah, like a boxer and a promoter, you have your time and then it goes. And mm. and I think it just outlasted. He, he went on a little bit too long at Yeah, Arsenal. yeah. I mm. think he was up against it, wasn't he? He had to get top four yeah. most seasons yeah. and yeah, but know, that, with the but squad. But I get didn't... that as a business, but as a fan, you don't want top no. four, you want one. Of course it does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. That's what it's about, isn't it? Uh, and it feels like now, Mikel Arteta has probably got, we saw about Highbury there and the buzz and the atmosphere, the culture, it seems like it's got it back now at the new stadium, doesn't it? For the last The last atmosphere season. is amazing. Yeah. The la- how they've worked on that, and they have worked on it, and the players on the pitch, you see them, with, you know, when they, I mean, they're geeing up the crowd. Constantly doing it, it's, yeah. it's really, it really is, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite a fierce stadium to go to now mm. with the fans. Yeah. I mean, you know, it does, and it does bring the best out of them. Mm. And he's got a good bunch of players, but we do need, a, we need a proper designated striker there's mm. no doubt about it yeah. in, my, in my I'm doing my my pub job now <laughs> yeah. where, where they tell me what I should be doing with my boxers I'm going to tell do you ever want to get involved in in sort of the business side of, of football I nearly did I nearly game? did with uh, Terry Venables years ago um, when I, I actually got got the thing together for him to get involved with Spurs really yeah that we, was for you we did that in, Ars- in my box at the Ars- at the old Arsenal Stadium yeah, we sat down and we were going to do the deal with uh, Irving Scholar. He, Irving Scholar, I think it was. And Tony Berry was a director there mm-hmm. at the time. And uh, we were quite close. And the person who was going to fund it uh, literally disappeared. <laughs> and he went and done the deal with Alan Sugar. God, no way. Right. Right. Do you, you know when you see, when you go to Arsenal games, is it is it hard to detach from your job in the sense of, you're looking at the pre-match and thinking, ah, oh, do you know what? I would add this music or I would take this away or more lights or less lights. No, I love it what they're doing. Do you doing just get now. to go and enjoy mm. it? I love it. I like atmosphere. I mean, yeah. everyone, act what you want, what, what makes you enjoy sport is atmosphere. Even if something's, de- you know, like a pen- like that penalty shootout we had mm. um, for the, you know, a mm. uh, couple of months ago, it was just, you know, when it went quiet, just definitely quiet. There isn't any atmosphere. All there is is tension yeah. and it builds and builds. But anything like that, I mean, sp- there's nothing like sport, is there? Sport no. at its best mm. yeah. is what we all love. We all love our sport. We're all passionate about it and that's what we want to see. We just want to be entertained. We want to see the guy, we want to see superhuman effort and see, you know, see the best come through and, sh- and give their best and the valiant losers. You know, for me, I'm, I'm blessed. I lived in a council flat, fourth floor, of of uh, Priory Green Estate, Kendall House. That's where I was brought up. Lived on there, and I've been blessed. I mean, I've been everybody, I, everywhere in the world. I've met at people who I never thought of me. I, did I ever think I would be sharing a table with Muhammad Ali, or you know, going and being invited to go to Nelson Mandela's house because he's a boxing lunatic? I mean, you know, people that I never, never ever thought. Well, I just never even thought about it because. Mm. Where you grow up, that's your vision, isn't it? You, yeah. you know, you where you, yeah. you try and break out of your environment. And I've been, I have been blessed. I've, I've, I've had some great times in all, meeting meeting some of the best people. A couple of arseholes along the way, but <laughs> some of the best people you can meet. That's it's life. Been, it's been it? fun. Yeah, of course. Some it's amazing life. experiences. Yeah, what would you say? Are. I mean, if you're looking at it all and you were to pick one, what is? Mm. What's the craziest? Well, you mentioned a couple Warren there, but experience. like what you know, Nelson Mandela and yeah. Muhammad Ali. They're two. Nelson two Mandela. You've Nelson met. Mandela for me was was um, was amazing. I mean, Nigel Benn fought Sugar Boy Malinga, mm. and he got beat. And I wanted Nigel Benn to win, and you know he's with us. And 
on the Monday, we're back in the office and we got a call saying, would we go to you know, Nelson Mandela's office to go to, to South Africa to meet him? And I thought it was a get-up. I thought someone's taking the taking yeah. the pee out of us. And next day, I'm on a plane to South Africa, going to Joburg, sitting sitting in Nelson Mandela's house. And I'm like, I meet this fella, and you know, you meet people. You know, we all we've got our heroes mm. and whatever. And it wasn't like he was a hero, but when I met him, he was like, you felt you were sitting in the presence of somebody who was just well. He just threw off this aura of like he was very serene. You know, it seemed like a real, like when you say a gentleman, he was like mm. a gentleman. And he was, he was sitting in his chair and he was just, I'll tell you, he's the most impressive person I've ever met. I, wow. I just wanted to ask a question just on a personal one for you. When was your, obviously you've grown up in boxing, you've, you've done it, watched it since a kid. When's been your favourite sort of decade or moment? Because you go back to Sugar Ray mm. and Hagler Hearns and you go into... Eubank, Collins and Ben and then mm. into the millennium and Ricky Hatton and then obviously now. Did you have a, a moment where you thought the boxing's great? Is it a good place? I, I think it's great today. Oh, yeah. I would say that. But I mean, I genuinely do think because the fights are happening. And all those all those, fight, all those eras, they've always been, there's, there's been a lot of good eras and it's difficult. As a fan, watching like the Ray Leonard's, you know, the Alleys, the Foreman's, mm. the Frazier's, yeah. all those guys fighting each other, watching those fights, um, looking at, Roberto Duran, Tommy Hearns, I mean, I don't know, yeah. Larry Holmes is one of my f- most favourite fighters. Watching all those guys was just something special. And going to the I was lucky enough to go to see some of those fights before I got into boxing. But I think that was a great era. But there has been all those, you know, like Naz for me was mm. the best fun. But then Tyson's been the best yeah, fun. Yeah. And mm. what's happening now with Riyadh scene is like, what, you know, what, where is it? I'm 72 now and I'm thinking to myself, what on earth? Has happened here. Look what look where we are. Look yeah. what's going on here. I'm, you know, we're involved in it. We're we're talking about this big show in the UK in September. These are magical times and mm. and glory days for boxing. I mean, it's just phenomenal and it's 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 superb. And I'm and I'm loving every minute minute of it. And I've been, as I say, and I can't tell you, I've been very very lucky to be involved in it. Yeah. If if you could have two heavyweights in a ring, right? You can only watch one fight. Who would you pick over, after, well, over two any, any decade? The two heavyweights I would love to see fought each other would be Muhammad Ali against Tyson oh, because the press conferences would be the best <laughs> press conferences ever. Can you imagine having those two round the time? Because <laughs> whatever way you want to look, you know, Ali is the most colourful mm. and Tyson is also the same. He's, yeah. a, he's very, very colourful. The press conferences would be enough and then the fight would be would be brilliant, but uh, that, uh, that I would that is what I would have loved. That's the one I would love to have done. Yeah, yeah well, listen, that would be pay per view. Uh, Frank, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Um, I really appreciate it, mate. Me. Thank, Thank you very much. For me too. Yeah. Thank Thanks, you. Frank. Love. Brilliant. Thanks, man. Top man. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Frank's just left there. Um, before I get to eleven, uh, Steve Bunt. What the hell was that? You, why do you know so much about boxing? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know you were going to come. Steve Boxwell. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what? What was that? I love my boxing. I just, I, love... I didn't know that about you. No, I just sat there in awe watching. <sighs> I love my boxing. Steve, oh, Stevie yeah. Bunts over there I'm going. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to get him. I'm getting in for him for tickets for hundred percent. Oh, hundred percent. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. good. Over there, let's do it. Get us over there, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> Steve Boxwell. <laughs> it's fascinating that job he has, and, and having Eddie Hearn on and him on. You don't really have that in football so much, do you? You have it with managers, big yeah. personality managers, but you don't really have promoters in football no. that are sort yeah, of like what's selling the pro- the kind of product. Yeah, kind of Sky the do it, don't they? Or TNT do it in the run up. It's like you know like give it a name or something or give the derby yeah, a name yeah. but it'd be good to have a couple of people mm. that sort of that did dedicated it. to that yeah, yeah. that's just good. a bit of a difference between no, the sports it's interesting yeah. you know what like, obviously you know we're a football pod but you know sometimes like someone who's got that much experience in a sport and it's quite interesting getting a mm. you know t- he's, he's been in the game for so long yeah he's and top of the game as well yeah. like them two are the main the main guys yeah d- digging into it I thought it was really interesting mm. yeah. alright from that uh, I've got a wedding 11 here a, wed- okay, a uh, wedding 11 yeah is that okay alright okay All right, let's go with it uh, who sent this in um, I was going to say it was Tony Groom but he's the manager <laughs> <laughs> so, so he's the owner 
<laughs> Tony Croom's the owner. Uh, no, this is from no, Johnny. No. It's from Johnny. This is from, oh, from Johnny. Johnny. There you go. Johnny says, uh, yeah, we've got Tim Flowers in goal, mm. obviously. Uh, Rob Page Boy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rob Page Boy. <laughs> <laughs> Lewis Trump. Uh, Jay Spear Ring. Yeah. Um, Steve Speechwell. <laughs> It's my favourite. He gets a laugh every week. <laughs> Any name. You are. I don't know if we've said this every before, but name. you're the cuddly oh. toy on the generation game. <laughs> oh, Do you remember no. that? A cuddly yeah. toy. Yeah. That's every. you. Steve Speechwell. Steve Speechwell. You got wedding DJ Campbell. <laughs> yeah, that's Very good. nice. Yeah. Uh, Denver Freebar. <laughs> <Nice ledge. laughs> that would get away at a wedding. Freebar. <laughs> Thomas Wedding Party, yeah. uh, Raymond van der Vau, uh, <laughs> Grant Alter, so, uh, George Best Man. man. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Wow. Uh, Yossi Honeymoon. <laughs> Get on this one. Dibble <laughs> Ringy. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Dibble Ringy. Oh, uh, abs on one knee, Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> wow, Dennis Inlaw. <laughs> oh, these are fantastic. Uh -huh. And Posh, the love you. Uh, Eddie Val, these are the managers. And Mikel Hartetta, obviously the owner of Tony Groom. Yeah. Oh, that's done me. Oh. Oh. There's loads yeah. in the wedding 11, fantastic. isn't there? Fantastic. Got any more on there? Father of the McBridey. <laughs> McBridey. Oh. McBridey. Lionel Dressy. That's good as oh. well. <laughs> yeah, that's lovely. Lionel Dressy. Lionel Dressy. <laughs> Lionel Dressy. That is absolutely fantastic. Um, yeah, come on. Just trying to think of things at weddings. Yeah, I can't think of anything at weddings at the moment. Venue, Vicarage Road. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice. Rigobert first song. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well done, Crouchy. <laughs> Thank you. That was good. All right, all right. message here from Rory. Um, this is the same guy as before the police station chat. Oh. Uh, he says, after hearing the last episode, I asked my father-in-law for a few more details on Crouchy being at the police station. <laughs> Can't believe this is a double thing. He couldn't add much apart from the fact he would come in and have a chit-chat, but apparently Norman Wisdom used to do the same thing. So, so I guess what, what I can't figure out here is is the idea that you were sat in a police station next to Norman Wisdom. No, no, I never saw Norman Wisdom in there. You'd know if you see Norman no, Wisdom no, in there. I can't remember why I was in there in the first place. Let me get to the bottom of that, all right? Mm. All right, mate. All right, a message here from Cameron. Do you want to... This is... Yeah, snog, marry, avoid here from Cameron. Oh. Um, do you both want to take this on? Maybe that'll be fun. Uh, okay, snog, marry, avoid. Sam Allardyce, Neil Warnock, Mick McCarthy. I'm going to marry Neil Warnock. And I'll tell you why. Um, when he came on the, on the podcast, he'd just been to a show. You know, it's obvious that he looks after his... His wife, he, he likes to... He took her to Jersey Boys, didn't he? He took her to Jersey Boys. It seems to me that he likes to... He takes care of his partner. Mm. So I, that's why I'd marry Neil. Not that the others don't. I'm sure they do as well. But I just... I know for a fact that Neil, you know, adores his wife. So I think hopefully he'd adore me in the same way. Um, so, so then it Neil. boils down to, to snogging Sam Allardyce or Mick McCarthy. Marry. I, I think <laughs> who would you uh, right let, but I can help you with this let me frame it differently who would you rather snog Sam Allardyce or Mick McCarthy I think I'd rather snog Mick McCarthy <laughs> why I don't know <laughs> just a hunch huh? I'm sure only because I'm just thinking you know there was a long period where Sam Allardyce had a had a tash and I think Mick McCarthy had a tash as well oh, he but, but Sam had a real bushy one. I don't know it if was I was a bushy one. Not sure if I'd, I'd enjoy that. So I, I think I'd rather, I'd rather snog Mick McCarthy and avoid Sam Allardyce. Yeah, the byproduct of that is you're avoiding yeah. Sam. Yeah, and I love Sam as well, yeah. so it's not something I'd like to do. But mm. you said. Uh, yeah, I think I would probably I would avoid Mick McCarthy. Oh, it's Kev the Kit Man. Shall I answer it? Phoning. Oh, yeah. Hi, <laughs> son. I've heard you for ages. I haven't spoken to you for ages. How are you, mate? You, you were speaking to my mate out in Dubai, weren't you? I was. I was, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kev, I'm literally just it? recording a podcast at the minute. I'll, uh, you're, you're actually on it at the moment. Am I? Yeah. <laughs> you haven't got a sofa in your back, you, Kev, you have you? Hey, you do you don't want me on there, mate, because I can tell some stories about you. 
<laughs> See if he's free next week. Hey, Kev, you're free next week, mate. You're welcome on any time. <laughs> Unfortunately, mate, I'm going in for a hip operation. So. Oh, I, and do you know why I saw that carrying sofas up, up fucking balconies? <laughs> Nah, there's not enough carrying sofas up back at least, mate. You know what I mean? And not charging you, charging you enough to wash your kit. Aye. Hey, <laughs> uh, listen, mate. Hey, buzzing, you've got up, mate. So happy yeah, for you. Congratulations. Yeah. yeah. I'll be retiring for uh, soon, mate. So we'll have a bit of a crack in, right? Oh, mate, hundred percent, mate. Let me know, mate, and I'll uh, I'll come down. I'll, I'll do anything for you, mate. Yeah. You know that. Yeah. All right. Sofas up the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> Kev, Tom, mate. See you soon. Oh, no, mate. Sid. Sorry, just interrupted my Kev the kit man there. No, it's, Portsmouth, obviously. It's giving Sid's time to think. Yeah. So I was going to avoid Mick McCarthy, but I'm actually going to marry Mick McCarthy. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, just because um, he doesn't want to get back into football. He's good. He's at home. He's, he's not we're not up in sticks oh right they settled family life. we're settled so then I've got to avoid and snog uh, I would uh, I would I'd, I'd snog Big Sam would you? yeah yeah that, that like a big fella do that. you? <laughs> <laughs> if I had said Neil would you have no, said no, you no. like a you like a little fella? I'm going to avoid Neil. Okay. All right. Man, listen, there's no wrong or right answer. Yeah, that's a horrible it's question. A ridiculous <laughs> question. It's interesting, actually, because I just put a little less for what have you got snogging for? Sam um, and for Sid's here, A for avoid Neil Warner and M, and it all spells out Sam anyway, so it was written in the stars oh, for God. Sid's there, wasn't it? <laughs> because he loves a big man. <laughs> you lot are going to kill me. <laughs> You're going to, poor lad, you're going to be doing some punditry somewhere, oh, aren't you? You're going to be right in the middle and you're going to catch a fan. <laughs> you know, bigger lad on the you're side. You're going to say there. something about Erling Haaland or something like that. Someone's going to say, loves a big man. Love it. It. <laughs> a big man up top. <laughs> big man loves it on top. <laughs> All right, do you know what? One more, one more message. One from Aaron <clears throat> or Arjun. Uh, just uh, listening to the podcast where Jay, Joe Cole briefly mentioned Crouchy's dad finding a monkey in his hotel room in South Africa in World Cup 2010. Joe said you'd be able to tell the story better. So go on. What's the story? Um, yeah, true story. Yeah. Well, that, you found a monkey in your room? Yeah, South Africa in the World Cup. The, the family's hotel was my dad. So the family's hotel was in was basically in the, kind of like the, the rainforest or the forest, whatever it was in South Africa and there was monkeys everywhere and it said everywhere it said careful monkeys you know don't leave you anything unattended don't leave your windows open so my dad's sitting there in when World Cup's on so he's watching the games he's like door open no problem he said three monkeys just burst in <laughs> he said they've looked at him <laughs> and he's he's on the couch and he doesn't want to move right he's got fucking hell what's going on <laughs> anyway my mum's screaming because they've come into the bedroom and what so they've gone Straight for the fruit bowl, bang, they know where they are. Fridge, open the fridge and got like the chocolate and stuff out. And then one of them got the, the fruit bowl in the other room. So they're in and out within five seconds. And then they get to the like the balcony and they just look at my dad like, what are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> and then he went, they were in and out within 10 seconds. Gone. They've done it before. And they? Unbelievable. What, you, what they were your dad doing. was just thinking that, that was the most surreal... <laughs> He must have a beer, like, a beer in hand, Gail. Yeah, well, did, that, did that just happen? Yeah. <laughs> unbelievable, yeah. Mate, unbelievable. Yeah. Well, what, what a finish to the podcast. <laughs> it's been a really good one today. Between Frank Warren, that, and a great game of Snog Mario Void. It's had everything. It's had everything. Oh, oh, yes. oh, All right. Well, thanks for listening.